So Amy Tucker is um, doing work on um, mental health stigma with young people. So very exciting presentation on a snowflakes chance in hell, young people and structural mental health stigma. She's presenting on the theoretical motivations and findings from her study. She's done work with young people. So she's used interviews, focus groups, as you'll hear shortly. Uh, and I think she'll have um, quite interesting findings in relation to stigma as a structural force of inequality in mental health. So over to you, uh, Amy, if you're ready. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, this is just a, a presentation that gives us overview of my um, thesis. Um, I will be talking about some difficult subjects, though, um, experiences of specific mental health issues. So if you do feel like you need to leave, please feel free to do so. You can always email me as well. My email's at the end of this um, presentation. Um, so in 2016, uh, interesting discourse about young people began to emerge and it was this idea um, of young people as a snowflake directed mainly at sort of Gen Z millennials. Um, it, originally this idea of a snowflake came from Chuck Polinick's Fight Club um, where he says you're not special, you're not a beautiful unique snowflake, you're the same decaying organic matter as everything else. Um, this idea of the snowflake um, as applied to young people entered into societal discourses as well as the dictionary. Um, we can see the dictionary definition here, which suggests that a snowflake is a person who believes that they have special qualities um, and should receive um, special treatment, um, a person who is too sensitive to criticism and easily upset. Um, we can see these discourses in um, sort of online um, memes as well as uh, newspapers. It's a particular favourite of the Daily Mail um, to use this term snowflake, um, which labels people narcissistic, um, oversensitive and not resilient enough. Um, but this is quite an important way of understanding young people and their mental health. And this discourse coincides with another slightly more worrying discourse about young people's mental health being in crisis. And we can see this in um, quite recent um, newspaper articles, which suggest that because of this pandemic, um, young people's mental health is, is more in crisis than ever before. Um, and the Mental Health Foundation says that 10% of children um, and young people have a diagnosable mental health problem, but I would expect to see that this number would increase because the Mental Health Foundation are working on data from 2008, so we need more up-to-date data about this. Um, so these discourses frame young people in quite a stigmatising way, and particularly their mental health. See Me, um, Scotland's anti-stigma campaign, are trying to tackle these discourses. They've got online campaigns that suggest it's okay not to be okay. And this suggests that um, young people um, and their mental health is stigmatised, but it ought not to be, and attempts to challenge these ideas about stigma. But what is stigma? Stigma um, came originally from Erwin Goffman, who was a sociologist in the Chicago School. He suggests that it's an attribute that is deeply discrediting and reduces that person with the attribute in our minds from a whole unusual person to a tainted, discounted one. We can see um, Goffman's relationship to symbolic interactionism. Um, and he understands stigma through micro interactions with individuals and relationships with others who sort of apply stereotypes to day to day life. And he constructs individual reality as happening through um, interactions with other people. This is quite a micro view of stigma. Um, however, there is a dearth of understanding of structural stigma. Um, particularly in the context of young people and their mental health in Scotland. Hatson Bueller and Link give us a useful definition of structural stigma, which is the um, societal level conditions, cultural norms and institutional policies that constrain the opportunities, resources and well-being of the stigmatised. In my thesis, I argue that understanding stigma at structural levels is lacking in existing literature um, 
and that our current understandings of stigma as a micro interaction is um, only one way of understanding stigma. Um, however, that is not to say that Goffman's understanding is not unhelpful or is unhelpful. Um, Pesco Salido highlights that the value of stigma um, can be seen in the psychiatric survivor movement who were able to use this concept um, to highlight the violence and suppression involved in psychiatric care. Um, however, the psychiatric survivor movement is based on adults mostly who have access to educational capital that the young people in my study didn't necessarily have. So what does stigma mean to young people? Um, I asked them and it sort of turns out that it's not that easy to understand for young people. Tom says that he wasn't sure. He didn't understand the whole stigma part of my question. He didn't understand it. Um, this sort of, this quote came from um, a focus group with young people and some of them had been talking about what stigma means or what it might mean. Um, and Tom had been quiet throughout and then he was brave enough to sort of say, I don't know actually what, what is stigma? What are you talking about? Similarly, Caitlin in another focus group said that she had absolutely no clue what it was. She'd maybe heard it at school, but felt stuck and didn't ask. This um, sort of highlighted to me a problem in terms of stigma as a concept itself. It's not um, something that is accessible for young people or for all young people. Um, and it's sort of couched in this expert discourse. But this also highlighted that um, my approach to data collection maybe wasn't as suitable as I'd thought. I'd initially gone in with this idea of not telling young people what stigma was so that I was imparting, so I was trying to avoid imparting my own bias on the concept. And that's a fine idea had stigma meant anything at all to them. Instead of telling them what it meant and discussing it with a shared knowledge, I sort of positioned myself as a gatekeeper to this concept and to have more power in that situation than they did. Um, and I did this inadvertently, but it's important to know about power relations when you're talking to young people and conducting research with them. Um, it also sort of turned out, um, also um, can we just note that um, participants were allowed to choose or sort of opted to choose their own pseudonyms. So there are a couple of weird ones in there. Um, but uh, Orphea suggests that she didn't use the word. So even if they do know what it means, they don't use the word stigma. Um, she uses other words that are harsher. And this idea of um, stigma as inaccessible to young people can also be seen in Orpheus's quote, but she sort of suggests that there is a, a sort of euphemistic quality to the lack of access that they have. And it's not as harsh or as explanatory as she would like it to be. So because of this um, lack of access or lack of understanding of stigma, that sort of meant that I questioned um, the importance of stigma for young people. Hot Wheels suggested that it wasn't the biggest problem um, that she had come across and she didn't realize it was a problem until she was actually told that it was, which I think is quite important because we have constructed stigma as something that is applied to mental health, but in her lived experience, this wasn't the case. Um, so I sort of asked again, young people, what is important to you then if it isn't stigma? And Caitlin suggests that mental health workers weren't the best thing. She felt like going to CAMS was one of the worst things she could have done because she just came out thinking, well, what was the point of that? We can also see stigma um, in services. Now, um, current understandings of young people's attempts at help seeking portray stigma as something that is um, an attitude which prevents young people from asking for asking for help um, or their internalized stigma stops young people asking for help. However, the young people in my study turned this on its head and said, um, so for example, Hot Wheels says that her friend was really depressed um, and had been on a waiting list for ages. People kept sort of telling her that um, she needed to get help, but treatment wasn't as readily as available as, as it should be. That isn't to say, though, that there isn't stigma in um, institutions when they do get there. 
um, Violet highlights this in her GP, who tells her off for self-harming and treats her like a naughty child. Um, and Tess suggests in her first, um, first sort of CAMS appointment with a psychologist, the psychologist um, dismisses her um, claim of her diagnosis of depression and anxiety and says, you haven't been diagnosed with depression and anxiety because you're sat upright, you've got your makeup on, you came here today. Um, if you were depressed, you would look terrible. And this draws on discourses about what a young person with mental health should look like but also sort of takes this idea that young people are kind of malingering and attention seeking when they claim to have um, mental ill health. The role of social structures can also be seen in young people's descriptions of their mental ill health um, or just of their experiences of mental health generally. So William suggests that the area he lives in was called suicide corridor because there were so many suicides they've put up Samaritan signs down all of the um, lamp posts and I suggested well why is there such a suicide rate high suicide rate in your area and he puts it down to socioeconomic deprivation his grim description of the lack of hope um, in his area there's railways there's nothing blocking them and it's better and a more instant solution than taking pills um, suggests that William really does understand the social structural impact of mental um, on mental health in his society. Um, so these structural ideas are important as well, if not more important than the individual micro interactions that we sort of tend to understand stigma. Um, however, there are some um, examples of counter discourses and this challenging of these discourses and the services that young people sort of interact with um, are viewed as a structural thing to try and challenge these um, discourses about young people not being resilient enough. So Ross suggests that it's that young people have to build resilience because what is out there to support them just isn't adequate enough. Um, and this shows that Ross is able to challenge the understandings of um, young people as snowflakes um, by turning that around and saying, actually, it's not our own weakness or failing. It is that the societal structures that are supposed to look after us have failed us. So um, I've sort of synthesised my ideas into this um, model of stigma. We can see here that if you understand stigma through a sort of post-structural understanding um, which focuses on discourses and power um, we can see that there's layers that affect the young people um, and this these sort of historical discourses that construct uh, stigma and mental health and young people trickle down um, and influence their everyday lived experience um, and I think if we view stigma as a discourse and through this frame of structural understandings this can add more value to young people's understandings of the concept and might be more useful in an emancipatory way um, yep so that's me thank you for listening if you've got any questions please feel free to email me or you can ask at the end of this uh, seminar thanks very much <laughs>